Just what is the role of gangs in Chicago's violence problem? A spate of shootings of young people in recent weeks has put a renewed spotlight on the issue. The city has had gangs as long as it has been incorporated, but the structures have evolved over the years, leaving a more fractured and perhaps a more violent system than ever before. And joining us are Jervon Hicks, a former gang member who spent time in prison. He is now a life coach at the Youth Peace Center of Roseland. Miguel Cambre, Director of Strategic Partnerships and Initiatives for Ready Chicago at Heartland Alliance. And Beneth Lee, also a former Chicago gang member who spent 15 years in Illinois prisons. He is now an instructor in criminal justice studies at Northeastern Illinois University and co-founder of the National Alliance for the Empowerment of the Formerly Incarcerated. We did invite the Chicago Police Department to send a representative to join us tonight, but they declined. We do appreciate all of you being here. Welcome to Chicago tonight. Yes, yes. Thanks for having me. All right, I'll start with you, Javon. So help me understand the allure of gangs in Chicago for so much of the city's youth. Um, I, I just know off, off top, uh, social media plays a large role, um, a big part of, of the influence. Um, I don't necessarily call them gangs because there's really no structure. They're more like cliques, more like factions. Um, and just groups just like radicals. So um, we just try and engage those guys. We, we deal with hot spots, um, high crime areas, uh, key individuals, and just try and get them to buy into the system by building relationships and building a bond and showing them something different by providing them services that can help them become better men as they grow, grow within the community. And, and, and Jervon, back in the day, can you describe what drew you uh, into that kind of life? Um, I think I was more intrigued by, um, you know, to be honest, uh, it was a, it was a Duke Blue Devil jacket. They had a pitchfork on it, um, and I kind of levitated to that. Um, and then I was just re really interested in the laws and policies. So I was I was really more into teaching guys how to be better at what we were as part of an organization. But um, and, and then I just found myself having a love for guns, and, and I started getting myself in a lot of trouble. And, and, and that's what landed me here today. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Bennett, uh, you, you heard Javon talk about how gangs have changed. There's no real former structure. Uh, what is this structure right now compared to what it was 10, 20, 30 years ago? Well, um, you got some guys that, that honor the nation they're part of, you know, like the Vice Lord Nation, the Disciple Nation, Stone Nation. And you got some guys claim those names but they don't honor the nation itself and that's where the breakdown that you know like javon was saying you know since they done broke down that hierarchy and put them now yeah. not in state prisons but took groups of these so-called heads of organization put them in the federal system to mm -hmm. break down communication and the ability to communicate so now you got a lot of clicks because like i said you got some guys that might be vice lords but they don't honor the vice lord nation, mm. they renegade. And then you might see a clique of guys on one block, but it might be five vice lords, two disciples, and one stone, and they're getting money together and they're hustling. And that's how they're moving now. So it's kind of hard to say this is a street gang specifically that did this act. Mm. You know? so. so with with prosecution and RICO cases, it's kind of broken down into more scattered system, more anarchic system. Uh, Miguel Cambry, when you counsel young kids, how much of the violence that you see, the trauma that you see, is a result of, of gang-related activity versus just simple interpersonal conflict? Um, so just to be clear, Ready Chicago provides cognitive behavioral therapy and group sessions for individuals. And the idea of the cognitive behavioral therapy is to disrupt impulsive behavior. So I think when we're interacting in terms of our participants and the communities that we serve, we think about the, the impact of sense of community and the communities disinvestment. So criminal opportunity is sort of a derivative of that um, from the disinvestment that we have lived for hundreds of years in, in our spaces. So um, I, I don't know to, to the two gentlemen's point on sort of the deconstruction of gangs today and back then. I think a lot has changed from back then. I mean, at one point we were party crews and then we were picked up by a fraction, right? Or they were sort of just neighborhood corners specifically that represented sports alliances that turned into bigger fractions. Um, so I agree that there, there's been sort of a change in the evolution of the way that folks affiliate or associate. Um, but again, in terms of the recklessness that you asked earlier, it's a continuation um, of, of our environment and our environment uh, impact on us um, and our resilience to survive. 
um, and to be relevant in our communities. And speaking of survival, a big part of that is guns. Jervon, you were talking about how you became really drawn to guns. Uh, I've heard you say that you were addicted to guns at what point. Uh, can you just talk about that addiction <laughs> and, and why guns are just so prevalent? Um, even 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 when I when I began carrying uh, firearms, I just I just know it was a, a, a power move. Um, I don't think there's nothing to be hand, held in your hand that's more powerful than, than a firearm, unless you have a large bank account, a large load of money. However, the addiction came from seeing fear in others' eyes. Um, did I know I was doing wrong? Absolutely. Did I know it was illegal? Absolutely. Um, but the thing of getting caught was far from my mind. Um, and just like right now, today they running around here with 50 round drums and 100 round clips and switches and things that's that's like futuristic, right? And so that's that's more intriguing than them. Um, and like I told you earlier, it's more like, you know, we have a vaccine for, for, for COVID. I'm trying to find a vaccine for a trigger finger, something that I can inject in that finger to make them stop using it. And uh, until then, I'm not, and I'm not going to stop uh, until we figure out something else to add to the tool belt besides a weapon. And, and Bennett, you know, kids at a young age can be drawn into this. And even if someone offers them an alternative or says, stay in school, get good grades or come to my peace circle, that allure is still very powerful. So how do you combat that for young people? Well, most young people, uh, they get drawn into what's happening in the community. You know, the average high school a young brother in Chicago goes to is outside his neighborhood. So he might meet some friends at that high school that might be plugged with a certain set. And they become friends and then all of a sudden he claiming that set. Or he just might be in an area where it's a, a prevalent a street organization there, and because he lived there, now he's labeled as that, and so it's like I can't beat him, join, he get pulled into it. So I think what really need to happen, we need to get on these blocks, in these communities, build relationships, you know, get them to like talk to each other, because if I got a relationship with Javon, it'd be hard for me to shoot Javon. Right, if me and Javon got a relationship and he got buddies, I got buddies, uh, I might be talking crazy about doing something to him. One of his own guys can tell me, he said, man, you need to sneeze with that, man. Let me holler at you. you know, but those relationships got to happen. That's what the work we do in nonviolence, getting on these blocks and help build relationships, get brothers to look at things a little different. You know, again, so one, you, get when you get, when you get to folks fact. together in a room that might be part of different cliques, have you seen the tensions diffuse? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm from the Austin area. You know, we had a situation where there was two guys, two groups was at it. We brought them face to face, see what they all had in common. They came to an agreement, and then one brought up the fact you need to get this other group in here because that's their allies, and then we got them in. The next, you know, we had nine little cliques together talking. In the beginning, yeah, they came strapped up with their pistols, but after maybe the third or fourth meeting, you didn't see that anymore. You didn't see the security there. They would ask each other for a short on this cigarette afterward. It's just building those relationships, and yeah. then uh, incidents might happen in the community, right? today they'll call each other let's it's, investigate that before we react to it yeah. and that's because we done set up a safe environment for them to have that dialogue and look at all these variables that lead to tension interfacing seems to be so important and miguel Cambre, what about the work that your organization does on an individual level cognitive behavioral level how, how do you how do you reach uh, some of these youth well, similar to Banning, I mean, we, with some of our sites, uh, we, we have been able to engage over 700 individuals throughout four neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. And in one of our sites, we have about 12 mobs, right, 12 clicks um, in one site. So we, we, we work to build, similar to Benny's point, build a sense of community, a sense of purpose, and a sense of self-worth. And that happens through relational building and intentional building, and that happens over a duration of time. Um, obviously, a lot of folks carry guns for a sense of safety or a sense of perpetration, but uh, building a sense of hope and, and a sense of community helps sort of de-escalate that tension that you're referring to. And we start to see one another as humans, right? And the trauma behind our violence and the self-hate, you know, from one to another um, that sort of we've been, that's been built in us over the years. Such important work uh, to be done out there and such important work that you're doing. And we thank you all for uh, sharing your views here. Thanks for joining us. Thank Thanks you for, for having us. Thanks for having me.